Well, good morning. If you've been with us the last handful of weeks, we are on a journey through this series called Look to the Stars, examining the life of Abraham. We've jumped back to the Old Testament. We've been hanging out in the book of Genesis, which if you're not familiar with scriptures, Genesis is the very first book of the Bible. So if you're trying to find it, just turn to the beginning and you'll find it right there at the beginning of the the scriptures. We've been looking at the life of Abraham and looking at what God has to teach us through Abraham's life at what trials and joys Abraham has. And we've seen how God has set forward this covenant with Abraham over the last couple weeks, this covenant where God has said that he is wishing to bless Abraham to make him a great nation. Abraham, who has no offspring, God is going to make him into a great nation. And so last week, we talked about what happens when we try to take God's promises and we try to make them happen in our own time, in our own way. And how that usually doesn't go well. But it is much better to wait on God's timing, on God's ways, and to trust Him in what He is doing. And so this week, we're going to be continuing in the story of Abraham's life, examining another story of God's provision, of God's strength, and of God's goodness in his life. Before we do that, let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you for your word and the chance to learn from it each and every week. Lord, we thank you that it is alive and speaks to us. Lord, that you can use your word to meet us where we're at, to show us your goodness, to show us the love that you have for each one of us, and what a gift that is. And so, Lord, as we examine the story of Abraham, I pray that you would lead and guide us. Lord, that it would be your Holy Spirit that is speaking to each one of our hearts. Lord, may nothing that I say get in the way of what you wish to declare this morning, but may we be open and attentive to your Spirit's leading. Lord, may you give us ears that hear and hearts that can understand what it is that you are guiding us in. Lord, we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Well, as many of you know, one of the things that we've taken on here at SCOG, and perhaps you participate in it, perhaps you haven't, but is a Bible reading challenge. So we started with just the New Testament reading challenge for a summer, and then we've transitioned into also doing the year Bible reading challenge, where from September through May, if you stick with the challenge, you'll read through the entire Bible. And if you join us for the summer, we'll read through the New Testament in the summer. And so in one year, you'll read through the entire Bible and the New Testament twice. And it's been a joy to get to talk to some of you who have partaken the challenge with us, who have joined in on this challenge. And it is a challenge. I am currently behind on my reading right now, and I can tell you it is a challenge to keep up on it. But I also can tell you that it is so worth it, that the time spent in God's Word is always worth it. The time reading stories from the Old and New Testament, getting to see the entire picture of Scripture, is worth the investment I was talking with someone just last year who was reading through the scripture, and they were reading through the Old Testament and reading parts of scripture that they had never read before. And as we were talking about, they they were asking me, how can God destroy these entire cities? We see these instances in the Old Testament where God wipes out entire peoples or entire cities, and how can God do that? And how can we take a loving God on the one hand and then also see him destroy people on the other. That doesn't really mesh with their understanding of who they knew God to be when they read through Scripture before. And that's part of the beauty of something like the Bible reading challenge, is we get to see the whole picture of Scripture. Because there are things to learn in the Old Testament that we must wrestle with, and there are things to understand in the New Testament as well. And perhaps you've wondered the same thing. Maybe you've questioned if the Old Testament God is really the same as the New Testament God. Or you've heard people put them in two different categories, like, well, there's God in the Old Testament, and he was judgmental, and he was uh, vindictive, and he was angry, and then there's Jesus, God in the New Testament, and Jesus is kind and loving, and Jesus wants to hold your hand and walk with you. That's how some people view those two. And yet, the God in the Old Testament is the same as God in the New Testament, You see, God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. That's something that we know to be true is who God is, and he is faithful to who he is. And so today I want to look at the story in Abraham's life, a story in which we see sin 
and depravity and judgment and destruction. But we also see God's righteousness, God's mercy and grace in how he interacts with Abraham and Abraham's relative lot. So this morning we're going to spend our time in Genesis chapter 18 and 19. If you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to follow along or pull it up on your phone. But we're going to be in Genesis chapters 18 and 19. It's a fair amount of scripture, so we're going to move fairly quickly through it so that we can get through these two chapters and see what's occurring. But if you haven't read the story of Abraham and you're not really familiar with it, One of the things that's happened that we skipped over is after Abraham left, the Lord led him to move away from his family. We talked about how Abraham and Lot separate. They go their separate ways in Genesis chapter 13. But what happens as Lot goes and settles in a different area than Abraham is that he's captured as part of a king's conquest of the area that Lot had settled in. And Abram took it upon himself to go and to rescue Lot He heard from someone who had escaped the captivity that Lot had been captured. And so look at Abraham's bold move in Genesis 14. We read in verses 14 through 16. When Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, he led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them, and pursued them to Hobab, north of Damascus. And then he brought back all the possessions, and also brought back his kinsman, Lot, with his possessions, and the women and the people. So even though they've separated, even though they've gone their different ways, Abram, Abraham as we now know him after his name was changed last week, continues to care for Lot. When he hears that Lot's in trouble, he gathers all his men together, and they go and they take them back. They rescue Lot At the beginning of chapter 18, we see that the Lord once again appears to Abraham. He's done this multiple times. He's come to Abraham. He's given him instructions. He's told him about the covenant that he's establishing with him and the ways in which he's going to bless him. But this time, he comes in a little bit of a different manner. He comes traveling with two other men in the form of men. And it's God and these angels. There's three together. And as they come to Abraham, he invites them into his tent. He extends his hospitality to them to feed them, to provide rest for them. And they take him up on it. So our scene where we're going to jump in, we have Abraham, two angels, and the Lord sitting in his tent as he is extending hospitality to them. So starting in Genesis chapter 18 in verse 9, as the angel speaking, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? And he said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced in years, and the way of women had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah laughed to herself, saying, after I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you about this time next year, and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied it, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. He said, no, but you did laugh. So here we have Abraham and Sarah. They're in the tent. They're serving their guests. Customary was that the women would not stay after they had served the men that they would serve them a meal and then they would excuse themselves, but they'd perhaps still be in the tent, just kind of at the side or removed in another room of the tent. And so that's where we find Sarah when the angels are speaking with Abraham. And the Lord comes once again to affirm his promise to Abraham. God is continually steadfast in this promise to Abraham. He hasn't just told Abraham once that he's going to make him into a great nation, that he's going to give him an heir, But now he's told him, I believe this is the third or fourth time that he's come and told Abraham that this promise will come true. And even though Abraham and Sarah tried to make it come true on their own by choosing to take their slave Hagar and have Abraham conceive a child with her, and the Lord said, no, that's not the way I'm going to do it. That's not the way that this promise is going to be fulfilled, that my covenant with you is established. It's going to be through a son from Sarah, and you're going to call him Isaac. 
And yet, time continues to pass, and Abraham and Sarah continue to doubt God's word. And so the Lord shows up again to affirm that he will bring a child to Abraham and Sarah. So the two angels and the Lord come and visit Abraham, and they let him know that by this time next year, he will have a son. And Sarah responds by laughing. She hears this, what they're saying to Abraham, and laughs, thinking, how could this be? Well, the text tells us that the way of woman had ceased to be with Sarah. So Sarah is no longer experiencing menstruation. Thus, she thinks this is crazy. How could she have a baby? How could she still have a son? What could God mean that she would bear a son in her old age? And so she laughs at the notion, at the idea, as most people who are in Sarah's shoes would as well. And yet Sarah is not the only one who has laughed. If you remember back in chapter 17, verse 17, when God tells Abraham that he's going to have a son, Abraham also laughs. In fact, he fell on the floor and laughed at what God said would occur. And the Lord knows that Sarah has laughed. He knows that Sarah has laughed because he is all-knowing. He didn't have to hear Sarah laugh. He didn't have to experience it or be talking with her to know that in the other part of the tent, wherever she was, that she laughed at this notion that the Lord would give her a child. And if you look at chapter 18, verse 14, I love this phrase. It says, is anything too hard for the Lord? What a beautiful phrase. Is anything too hard for the Lord? You see, there is nothing too hard for the Lord to accomplish if he wants. If it is in his will, the Lord can do whatever he desires. Nothing is too hard for him. Not giving a child to a woman who is barren, not establishing a great nation out of just one man and one woman who have no children. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. I love how Andrew Steinman in his commentary on Genesis puts it. He says, quote, In his mercy to the couple, and indeed to all people, he does not withdraw his promise because of Sarah's disbelief, but repeats it, nothing that he, noting that he will come back and that this will result in Sarah bearing a son in about a year's time. You see, God has confirmed his promise as he's revealed himself to Abraham and Sarah. Even though Sarah continues to deny that she laughed, continues perhaps to doubt that this promise will come true, God does not turn back on his word. God does not give up on his word to them that he will provide a son. In fact, in one year's time, he gives them a son. He gives them a son named Isaac. Now, maybe you don't know, but the irony here is that Isaac, that name which God had told Abraham would be the name of his son, means laughter. A constant reminder probably from the Lord that Abraham and Sarah both laughed when God told them they would have a son, and yet now they have a son whose name means laughter. A constant reminder that God worked even when they didn't expect it, even when they perhaps doubted what the Lord would do. So Sarah denies that she was laughing, but the Lord knows that she had, and yet is continually gracious towards them. We're picking up in verse 16. The scene changes in our text. It says, Then the men set out from there, and they looked down towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation? And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have chosen him, that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice, so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, Because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So here, Abraham has been hospitable towards these guests. He has heard them continue to affirm the promise that he will have a son. And, and now as they're leaving, they go to where they can look out over the valley that has Sodom and Gomorrah in it. And the Lord says, shall I, shall I not tell Abraham what I'm about to do? Shall I hide from him what is coming? And the Lord decides to share with Abraham what is coming. 
He reminds Abraham of the importance of walking in righteousness and justice. And we see here in the text a little picture of why God is choosing to bless Abraham, of how he is making him into a mighty nation, of who Abraham will become and his descendants, that the earth shall be blessed in him. And we talked about the other week how that the earth being blessed in Abraham is eventually that his family line leads to Jesus Christ, who was born, who died upon the cross, who defeated death and rose from the grave, in whom we have forgiveness of sins. That the whole earth being blessed by Abraham is, comes through Jesus Christ and through the grace that we receive in Christ. And so the Lord shows that this is the path that's going to happen through Abraham because he has chosen him. Chosen him in order that he will command his children and his children's children to follow after the Lord. It says in verse 19, For I have chosen him that he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring to Abraham what he has promised him. You see, the Lord wants Abraham to continue to instruct the generations to follow him in righteousness and in justice. The importance of those pieces as he seeks after the Lord because God is a righteous God and God is a God of justice. These are characteristics of God that he wants us to bring about in our own lives as we pursue after him. As we raise kids, these are characteristics we are to teach them as well. Well, the Lord has heard an outcry of sin from Sodom and Gomorrah. And in Ezekiel, we see this sin described as pride, haughtiness, having plenty but not taking care of the poor and needy, and committing abominable acts before God. That's in Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 through 50, if you want to look it up on your own. Now, God already knows the depths of the sin in Sodom and Gomorrah. God is all-knowing, all-powerful, Nothing escapes him. And yet he still chooses to come down, to enter into the story, to tell Abraham what's going to happen, to bear witness to what's happening, and to go and observe the sin himself. Now, why would God do that? Well, the same reason we see later God send Jesus Christ to enter into humanity, to come into the story, to walk alongside us. It's because God cares. Because God cares for each one of us. It's because God's love leads him to enter into our story. To not just leave us to our own devices, but to come and to love us. To seek to give us a choice to turn from our sin. Time and time throughout scripture, we see that God gives people an opportunity to turn from their sin. To turn from their sin and to turn toward him. He uses his prophets all throughout the Old Testament to accomplish this, to call people away from their sin and to him. And ultimately, he sends Jesus to call us away from our sin and to him in the forgiveness of our sins. Now we have a choice of if we're going to accept his offer or if we're going to continue in our own path of destruction. And so as the Lord comes down, as he shares with Abraham what he's about to do to Sodom and Gomorrah because of the great sin that he has heard from him, we see a really interesting and unique scene play out between Abraham and the Lord. Picking up in verse 22. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? You see, Abraham is questioning God. I, so you're saying you're going to possibly destroy Sodom because of their sin, but are you really going to kill the righteous with the wicked? And I think this is often a question that we have of God is how will he treat the righteous versus the wicked? Will they all be lumped together at times? And so Abraham here is coming before the Lord concerned about if the righteous will perish with the wicked in that city or if God will choose to spare some. And so he starts to bargain with the Lord to ask God to spare those who are righteous, to intercede on their behalf. Picking up in verse 24, this is Abraham speaking. He says, suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it for you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom fifty righteous in the city, 
I will spare the whole place for their sake. So Abraham has called out God's justice. Lord, you are a God who is just. Won't you show that justice and won't you show that righteousness in sparing the entire city if there are 50 people within it who are righteous? Won't you not destroy an entire city if you can find 50 righteous people there? And so the Lord agrees. Okay, Abraham, if I find 50 righteous people, I will spare Sodom. For their sake, for the sake of those 50, the entire city will be spared at this time. And so Abraham answers in verse 27 and says, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Abraham knows that he is not worthy to do what he is doing. That in sight of the Lord who is holy, who is God, that Abraham is dust. Who is he to come before the Lord to try to bargain with the Lord for the lives of these righteous in Sodom? And so he comes to the Lord out of a place of reverence and fear, recognizing who he is and who God is, which is how we always should approach the Lord. There should always be an element of reverence and fear as we approach the Lord, recognizing that we are but dust, as Abraham says. So Abraham comes before the Lord in this way. Picking up in verse 28, he says, Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for a lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again, he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. Then he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose thirty are found there. And he answered, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose twenty are found there. And he answered, For the sake of twenty, I will not destroy it. Then he said, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose ten are found there. He answered, For the sake of ten, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way when he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. I've always enjoyed these verses where we watch this interaction between Abraham and the Lord, where Abraham seeks to intercede on behalf of the righteous in the city, hoping that there are 50 righteous or 45, 40, 30, 20, 10. If there are just 10 righteous people, God will spare the city. And while I'm sure that Abraham is certainly concerned for his family, for Lot, who he knows resides in Sodom, but also for others who may be righteous as well, would God sweep away the righteous with the unrighteous? And so Abraham bargains with God, starting with 50 and then goes down to 45, 40, 30, 20, and then 10. And the Lord shows his compassion in letting Abraham know that if he finds ten righteous, he will spare the city. Abraham's been willing to speak before the Lord, to intercede on behalf of others. And it's so interesting to look at this text and to see how Abraham handles this situation in a different manner than when he handled the one earlier when Lot was captured. You see, earlier when Lot was captured, when Lot was in danger, Abraham took it upon himself to go and to rescue Lot. He gathered his men, he went in his strength, and he went and he defeated them and helped save Lot. And yet this time, Abraham relies upon the Lord. He doesn't go in his own strength to save Lot. He doesn't run down to Sodom with his men to try to rescue Lot before the Lord destroys the city. He doesn't do that this time. He puts his trust in God's judgment, in the righteousness of God and God's will. In fact, when it's all done, Abraham returns to his place. Rather than taking it upon himself to rescue Lot, he returns to his tent. You see, Abraham has done what he needed to do. He has interceded on behalf of others with his life. And this reminded me of the question of, do we intercede for others? with our own lives? Are we willing to go to the Lord on behalf of others, those who we know and those who we don't know, the righteous and the unrighteous, to pray for them, to intercede for them? Do we do what Abraham has done here? Or do we just choose to keep to ourselves, to only pray for ourselves and what we need rather than to intercede on behalf of others? 
I think Abraham gives us a beautiful picture here of intercession on behalf of others, who he knows and who he doesn't know, that perhaps the Lord will be moved. Well, we see the two angels head to Sodom, and they find Lot at the city gate. If you read through chapter 18 and chapter 19, it's really interesting how much they line up with one another. Like, they both start with Abraham sitting outside his tent, and the angels come, and he offers them hospitality. And in chapter 19, Lot's at the city gate, and the angels come, and he offers them hospitality. So they really mirror one another when you look through them together. But Lot's sitting at the city gate as the angels come into the city. And this is a position of respect. We know that Lot was a respected member of this community. And he urges these men to turn aside, to come to his home, so that he may care for them, so he may extend hospitality to them. And the men tell Lot, no thank you, we're going to stay in the city square. And yet Lot urges them to come to his home. He knows that they need to come under the protection of his roof. He knows that it would not be a safe place for them to lodge in the city square, which shows us that Lot already has an idea of the depravity and sin that's present in the city in which he lives. He is not aloof to what's going on. He knows that it's a dangerous place, full of evil intentions. And so he urges these men to come and to reside in his home. And we've talked about this before. In this culture, when you bring someone into your home, you offer them protection as well. It's your way of saying that you vouch for them, that you represent them in that city, and that they are under your protection while they stay under your roof. So they turn aside. They take Lot up on his offer, and they come into his home, and he extends to them hospitality, providing them with a meal. Picking up in 19.4, it says, But before they lay down, the men of the city... The men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man surrounded the house. So notice that. It, it doesn't just say a small group of the men of the city came out. It doesn't just say ten of the men came out and surrounded the house. It says all of the men, all of the people, down to the last man, surrounded Lot's house. So they all come out, and in verse 5, they called to Lot, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Lot went out to the men at the entrance and shut the door after him. And he said, I beg you, brothers, do not act so wickedly. Behold, I have two daughters who have not known any man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But they said, stand back. They said, this fellow came to sojourn and he has become the judge. Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against the man Lot and drew near to break the door down. But the men reached out their hands and brought Lot into the house with them and shut the door. And they struck with blindness the men who were at the entrance of the house, both small and great, so that they wore themselves out groping for the door. So when Abraham and God were speaking about the righteous found in Sodom, Perhaps you found yourself wondering, is it really that bad? I mean, that you couldn't find 50 righteous men? That you couldn't find 10 righteous men and women in the city? Was it really that bad in Sodom? And yet this text gives us a glimpse of the evil in the city. The men of the city, they come and they surround Lot's home, demanding that his guest, the two men that were staying, be brought out so that they can have sex with him. Now, some people will try to suggest that this word that's used here, know, when they say they want to know them, that that's really just a desire to understand who it is that Lot has staying with him. That really, the men that have surrounded, they just are concerned with protecting their city, and they want to make sure that those men who Lot has in his house, that they understand who they are. Some will try to suggest that. And yet, that is a false interpretation of what the text is saying. And we can know this, we can refute this suggestion. Throughout Scripture, this word no is used many times. It's frequently used to describe sexual relations. Between a man and a woman, between men and men, it is used to describe sexual relations. And also, we see that Lot moves forward by continuing, or sorry, by begging them not to act so wickedly. So if all they wanted to do was question these men and figure out where they were from and who they were, Lot would not say, I beg you not to act so wickedly. And lastly, 
we see that Lot chooses to offer his daughters to the men. His daughters who, quote, have not known a man. Now, Lot clearly understood the men's intention and their request to be one of the sexual nature. And I, I want to pause here and say that Lot's choice to offer up his daughters to offer his daughters to the crowd instead of his guest is, in fact, evil. That was a horrible decision by Lot. I know he's trying to protect the men who he had brought under the shelter of his home, but this is not the way to do it. And that would have been an evil choice had he given his daughters to the crowd. And it's interesting because where we see Abraham intercede righteously, Lot tries to appease the evil of these men rather than trusting and turning to God. Lot tries to find a way that he can perhaps satisfy their evil intent and appease them rather than denying it or calling it what it is. And so Lot's decision to say, take my daughters, is not a good one. And scripture is not telling us that that was the righteous thing or the correct thing to do. That was the wrong thing to do, and that was an evil thought. But the reality is, evil intentions are rarely appeased by giving something other than what people desire. And so the men of Sodom demand that Lot stand back so they can continue with their evil intent. In fact, they begin to threaten him with how they're going to treat him, saying, who are you to judge us, a sojourner, someone who's come into our city, who wasn't born and raised here, who's come and lived here now, you're going to judge us? You're going to tell us what's right and wrong? How dare you? And so they start pushing against Lot until he's pressed up against the house. And verse 10, the angels intercede now on Lot's behalf. They bring him back into the house and they strike the men all with blindness so that they're left groping around. You see, the result of sin, apart from Christ, is death. And we see this truth play out in the lives of the unrighteous in Sodom. The angels give Lot a chance to gather his family and to flee Sodom before it's destroyed. And so what we see is Lot goes to his son-in-law's those who are supposed to marry his daughters and tries to convince them to come with him, to leave with them, because Sodom will be destroyed. And yet they respond by laughing at Lot, by laughing that their city will be destroyed and that they really need to flee. And so Lot ends up taking just his wife and his two daughters, less than the ten righteous that Abraham had asked that the city be spared for. for. It's just Lot, his wife, and his two daughters, who are fleeing out of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot negotiates to flee to a small city called Zoar, and so he takes off, fleeing before the angels are going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And picking up in verse 23 of chapter 19, the sun had risen on the earth when Lot came to Zoar. And then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from the Lord out of heaven, and he overthrew those cities. And all the valley and all the inhabitants of the cities and what grew on the ground. But Lot's wife behind him looked back, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham went early in the morning to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And he looked down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the valley. And he looked, and behold, the smoke of the land went up like the smoke of a furnace." So it was that when God destroyed the cities of the valley, God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow when he overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So our text wraps up this morning with the Lord destroying these cities for their wickedness. God is a just God, but he will also not tolerate sin. God will not let sin continue he may allow it to continue for a time. He may allow it to continue long enough to give you an option to turn from your sin to him. As I said earlier, that's part of the story of Christ entering into humanity, is to give us a chance to turn from our sin. But God's holiness demands that sin be dealt with. And there will be a time of judgment for each one of us. And the question will be if we are covered by the blood of Christ as our Savior or not. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in our text today was in direct relation to their sinful behaviors and their unrighteousness. And we see here that even though the angels had allowed Lot and his family to escape, 
that there still was an expectation of obedience upon them as they escaped. Because one of the instructions that the angels had given Lot and his family was to not turn back. They were to flee the city, and they were to not turn back and look upon it. And yet Lot's wife chose to stop and to look and to turn back. And the result is she turned into a pillar of salt. And this may seem harsh. It may seem odd to you as well. And yet the angels had given her clear instructions. Jen Wilkins describes when Lot's wife looks back, stating the sense of the phrase looked back is that she, quote, regarded, considered, paid attention to. In other words, dragged free of her life of self-focus and set well on her way to freedom, Lot's wife looked longingly and lingeringly on her past, even as it was being consumed by the fiery wrath of God. And that's why she suffered the fate that she suffered. Because she looked back upon perhaps her family, perhaps those who she was born to, perhaps her previous life of sin. But she looked back upon it rather than looking forward to what God had for her as she had been set free from the place of destruction. Our scene ends with Abraham back at the place where he had spoken with the Lord, back at the place where he had negotiated that the city be spared for ten righteous. Looking over Sodom and Gomorrah, looking over the place that he had tried to save, looking over the place where Lot had lived, and God had remembered Abraham. Even in the midst of the destruction, God remembered Abraham, and he sent Lot out of the city. Abraham once again played a part in saving Lot, although this time it occurred not physically by going and saving him by his strength, but by placing his faith in the Lord and in God's faithfulness. You see, Abraham could do this because he knew God was just. He knew that God was a just judge and that God would act accordingly. And we too can know that God is a just God and that even though God is a God of judgment, and that did not end with Jesus Christ coming, that there still is judgment, that we also know that in that justice, God has given us an opportunity for freedom from our sin by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. So what can we learn from Abraham's story, from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, one of the things that I think is so key and important for us is that section when Abraham speaks with the Lord and goes back and forth with the number of people. It's that aspect of interceding on behalf of others. You see, I think we too must be willing to intercede for others. Perhaps you've heard of it called intercessory prayer, but it's this idea that you're interceding on behalf of another in prayer. Praying on behalf of someone else, uh, perhaps praying for their strength, praying for their healing, praying for their protection if they're going through a difficult time, but you're interceding on behalf of someone else before the Lord. If you're not going to the Lord praying for yourself and for your strength and for your might, but you're going on behalf of another, as Abraham did for those who lived in Sodom. I was listening to an audio book a few weeks ago, and it's called Devoted by Tim Challies, and he shares a story of all these amazing women and their sons. And it's a wonderful book. It's got a handful of stories of the amazing women who have raised these men who have come to the Lord or who have served the Lord in mighty ways. And some of them are famous men and women, like Charles Spurgeon and his mother or John Wesley and his mother. But some of them are more modern stories. And in there, he shares the story of Angela Ewan and her amazing story. You see, Angela Ewan had two sons. And one of her sons, Christopher, she had prayed that he would take over the family business. Now, their entire family was atheists. They didn't believe in God. And as Christopher got older, he admitted to his parents that he was gay. And his mom really struggled with this. She was an atheist and just really struggled with the concept that her son was gay. In the midst of a cold marriage and struggles with her other child as well, now the fact that her son was gay was too much for her. And so Angela decided that she would go and say goodbye to her son and that she would take her own life. For some reason, even though she was an atheist, before visiting her son, she decided to go and see a chaplain who gave her a small booklet on God's love. And the next day on the train ride to go visit Christopher, she read about God's love for her 
and she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. So as she showed up to visit her son, instead of saying goodbye, she simply told him, I love you no matter what. She then embarked on a journey of intentionally praying for her son's soul. She wasn't praying that he would turn from his ways of homosexuality. She was more concerned with his soul. And so while her son was organizing parties and events in the gay community and had become a drug supplier and a fixture in that community, she for years earnestly pleaded with God to save her son's soul. She converted an unused shower in the home to a prayer room and spent so many hours praying and studying her Bible each morning that her knees became hard and calloused. She committed every Monday to prayer and fasting, and once even fasted for 39 straight days. And she enlisted hundreds of friends to gather with her to intercede on behalf of her son. Christopher ended up being arrested and sentenced to six years in a federal prison for his drug trafficking. Tim Chalice writes in his book, On his third day in prison, Christopher walked past a pile of trash and noticed a book lying there. He picked it up and found it was a brand new Gideon's New Testament. With nothing better to do, he went back to his cell and began to read. He read it through, then read it again and again, and it began to make sense. He began to even join a friend to study the Bible together, and then he received the sudden devastating news. A blood test had shown that he was HIV positive. A short time later, he was transferred to another prison, where he found these words scribbled on the underside of the top metal bunk. If you're bored, read Jeremiah 29, 11. He did, and for the first time, considered that he, even he, might have a hope and a future. For the rest of my life, I was going to live with this felony on my record, like a permanent stain branded on my soul. But with God, it seemed I had no record. I had no debt to be paid. I had no shameful past. I wanted that. Just the possibility of hope and a future seemed to brighten my gloomy cell and improve my dreary morning. Maybe I actually did have something to look forward to. It's a really amazing story, and his mom actually shares that she had the Lord impress upon her that he had come to the Lord before she ever heard it from him. And so when they finally met, he told her, I have something to tell you, and she said, I already know that you've come to the Lord. Well, upon his release from prison, Christopher earned a Master's of Arts in Biblical Exegesis from Moody and then went on to complete his doctorate at Bethel Seminary. And he now teaches at Moody Bible College and travels with his mom to speak to churches and prisons and college campuses about the work of the Lord in his life. His mom spent countless hours interceding on his behalf, praying for him, What an amazing witness of the work of prayer. You see, we all as followers of Christ have the ability to intercede with our prayers. This isn't something that's reserved for people who have followed Christ longer or who have read the entire Bible or who have a certain degree or a certain title. But each one of us who professes Jesus as our Lord and Savior has the power of the Holy Spirit within us and has the ability to intercede on behalf of others And each one of us should be praying in this way. So who is the Lord perhaps leading you to intercede for? Who is it who's been heavy upon your heart that rather than just think about, you need to go to the Lord and intercede on behalf of, and not just once, but time and time again? You see, it's so easy for many of us, myself included, to think of someone and to pray for them once and check the box, I'm done praying for them. I'll move on to the next person on my list. But the power that I believe occurs when we're willing to intercede time and time again, to continue to place our faith and trust in the Lord's work alone, is seen in the life of Christopher and the witness that he and his mom have of the power of intercessory prayer. So may we be people who believe in the power of prayer, who don't just talk about prayer who don't just read about prayer in the Bible, but who actually live out the power of prayer each and every day. The other aspect of the story that I believe is so important for us to remember in our lives is the fact that judgment is real and that God's grace is offered to us as well. Sodom and Gomorrah serve as an example of the fact that judgment awaits those who turn their back on the Lord. 
Jude 7 speaks to this fact as it recounts Sodom and Gomorrah and talks about the sin that occurred and the people who did not turn to the Lord. And if we know God's judgment is real, then our response to our sin is of the utmost importance. Will we confess our sin and turn to God and seek to walk in his righteousness? Or will we confess our sin and turn to God and yet like Lot's wife, continue to look back longingly upon our sin? Or will we reject God's offer of grace and indulge in the sin in our lives? These are questions that have life-changing, eternal consequences. And there's only one answer to the problem of sin, and that is Jesus Christ. In Jesus alone will you find forgiveness for your sins and will you experience God's grace. In Jesus alone will you find the abundant life. In Jesus alone will you find the life of peace. He alone offers those things to us. It is in him alone when we place our faith and our trust that we will know peace and forgiveness and the grace of our Lord. Abraham showed us his trust in God's righteousness by not jumping in to rescue Lot, but rather trusting God's will. So this morning, are there areas of your life that you need to seek forgiveness for? Are there areas of your life that you've looked back upon that you need to give up and give to the Lord, seeking his forgiveness? Don't delay. Don't wait any longer If you don't know Jesus, if you've never accepted him as your personal savior, don't give it another day. Turn to him. Confess your sins and seek his forgiveness. There is no other way. There is no other way you will experience the joy it is to be a son or a daughter of Christ. May we, as followers of Jesus, who are seeking to live our lives in accordance with the Holy Scriptures, Place our entire faith in God's righteousness and grace. May the allure of culture not tempt us to look back, to have a longing in our hearts for the way of the world. But may our eyes be fixed upon Christ and may our lives reflect the grace of Jesus in all that we do. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for Abraham, for the witness that he is and what it looks like to place our trust continually in you. What it looks like to know that you are just and that your righteousness is great. So Lord, I pray that you would help us to know these truths today. Not just in our minds, but deep in our hearts. May we know your righteousness and your goodness. And may that lead to a deep trust that your way is the best way. Lord, even when it doesn't make sense to us, even when we read things in Scripture that don't align with culture and that seem confusing, Lord, may we be able to humble ourselves under your word to say your way must be better because you are God and you know best. And so, Lord, empower us in this this week. Give us the courage to walk the narrow path. And Lord, give us the courage to not look back but to fix our eyes upon you in all that we do. And may we in turn know the goodness of walking the way of Jesus. And I pray this all in your holy name. Amen.